I'm just going to. This meeting is being recorded. I'm just going to go over some rules of engagement and go through how we'll do uh, the, the forum today, and then I'll introduce our speakers. So if you are not speaking, if you can have your mic muted, that would be great. Um, we'll be recording this session, so if you do not want to be recorded, you can shut your, you can stop video on the Zoom, um, and uh, we will start with an introduction of our speaker. We'll have them talk uh, for about 30 to 45 minutes. We'll have a first set of questions from Dr. McConey, and then we'll open it up and have a Q and A um, moderated, uh, where everybody can ask questions. You can raise your hand. Um, in the on the zoom with the raise hand function you can ask your question in the chat box um, and then after that we will have an unrecorded unmoderated section discussion called our after party so um, thanks for your patience as we deal with some technical difficulties um, all right let me just get the uh, powerpoint downloaded and ready to share and then i'll introduce our speaker All right, so today we have uh, Horace G. Campbell, who holds a joint professorship in the Department of African American Studies and the Department of Political Science at Syracuse University. His most recent book, Global NATO and the Catastrophe, the Catastrophic Failure in Libya, Lessons for Africa in the Forging of African Unity from Monthly Review Press. Um, his most well-known book, Rasta and Resistance, from Marcus Garvey to Walter Rodney, is going through its eighth printing and has been translated into French, Spanish, Turkish, and Italian. He has also authored Barack Obama and 21st Century Politics, A Revolutionary Moment in the USA, and Reclaiming Zimbabwe, the Exhaustion of the Patriarchal Model of Liberation. From 2016, uh, sorry. From 2016 to 2018, he served as the distinguished Kwame Nkrumah Chair at the Institute of African Studies um, at the University of Ghana. So welcome, Dr. Campbell. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for inviting me. Sorry, it's just taking a second to pull up the PowerPoint.
whenever you're ready. Whenever you're Thank ready. You. Go ahead. Are we ready to go? Sin free. Whenever you're ready, go ahead. Sin free. Can we thank the Global Forum one more time? And this is my second appearance in the Global Forum this year. And after discussing with Sin Free uh, the question of the implications of this war in Ukraine for the entire humanity, especially for Africa, he invited us to make this presentation. And I think this presentation is consistent with the theme of the global seminar to decenter hegemonic epistemologies and to decolonize the Western canon to facilitate other ways, waves of knowing. The next slide, please. So I see my brother Michael West is on this um, discussion. We're going to draw from Michael West for our definition of what we call global Africa and the constitute elements of the global African family. We want to speak about Pan-Africanism as the ultimate expression of the political aspirations of global Africa. Then we will get into the war in Ukraine and the different opinions on the war, the Pan-African position on the war, and the Pan-African position on NATO. And we will repeat the statement that we've made in the book on global NATO that the question of NATO is that it must be dismantled. And we'll draw from NATO's destruction of Libya to be able to make this point. Then we will seek to conclude by looking at the outcomes of wars historically and the task of the African progressive and the Pan-African intellectuals. I'm hoping that we can inspire what we call the radical Pan-African imagination, the radical Pan-African imagination, which conceptualizes what kind of world we want to see out of this war. Now, we are basing our presentation is how does an analysis of the war in Ukraine advance the collective and unified struggle for emancipation and liberation of all Africa? How does our analysis so next slide, please. So <clears throat> the global Africa that we're speaking about in this presentation is the African peoples in Africa and those Africans that are in the other parts of Africa that the African Union calls the sixth region. I am not one to call that Africans live in six regions because the it is really intellectual laziness for one to put all the African people in Europe, North America, Central America, Caribbean, and South America in one region. And our branch of the Pan-African movement, we are seeking to have the African Union revise this six region theory. Next, next slide, please. Next slide, please. So we draw from Michael West, Michael O. West, that the global Africa idea is an idea and belief that Africans and those of African descent have shared a similar experiences of oppression, exploitation, force, and coercion, which serve as the need for collective and united struggle for emancipation and liberation of all Blacks. One can argue the principal tenets of this idea are a shared experience, a collective struggle, and a global Black consciousness. Blacks not only share common ancestry, but a common history in the context of the slave trade, slavery, colonialism, and neocolonialism, which have created a shared experience for all Blacks. Next slide, please. The concept of global Africa is a call for the recognition, for the recognition of unity in diversity of all peoples of African African descent. It contends that African and dispersed offsprings constitute one family on the planet Earth. According to the African Union, the dispersed offsprings constitute one region. Yet the need for rigorous intellectual and policy planning may revise this concept of a sixth region. And we may be working with 11 regions instead of 
six regions in Africa. Now, next slide, please. Next slide, please. This war that is going on in Ukraine is a direct outcome of World War I. World War I occurred between 1914 and 1918, and it ended with an armistice. And Ukraine, after 1942, became part of the USSR. The history of the relationship between Ukraine and Russia goes back over 1300 years. But it was the decisive period of socialism where we had the definition of what was called Ukraine. Now, if the European partition of Africa was at the base of World War I, next slide, please. The Pan-Africanists always had their views on war. W. Du Bois stated that World War I was a component of the unresolved questions of the Berlin Conference. The unresolved questions of the Berlin Conference, 1884 to 1885. Next slide, please. So the country that is called Ukraine from 1922 to 1991 was part of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republic. The Union of so Soviet Socialist Republic comprised of 15 independent countries, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Belarus, Estonia, Georgia, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Latvia, Lithuania, Moldova, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, Ukraine, and Uzbekistan. Now, Ukraine, as um, a member of the USSR, was also part of the Warsaw Pact. Next slide, please. The Warsaw Pact was an organization created of the countries of the USSR plus Hungary, Albania, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Romania, and the GDR. Next slide, please. NATO was created in 1949. And when NATO was formed, the Pan-Africanists had their own view of NATO. For the Pan-Africanists, they did not accept the view that was put forward that NATO was a concert of democracies and there to um, oppose the USSR. For the Pan-Africanists, NATO was made up of colonial countries and the role of NATO was to defend colonialism. Next slide, please. W. D. B. Du Bois, in a submission to discussion of NATO, NATO said the arming of Europe by the United States is not so much to protect Western European from the East as to enable it to put down colonial arrest among the 250 million colonial peoples and other half a million of semi-colonials. He further said further, back of the Marshall Plan and Atlantic Pact, Atlantic Pact stand the slave trade and the exploitation of world's darker peoples. So this is our starting point, that NATO was not formed to fight the Soviet Union. NATO was formed to defend colonials. Next slide, please. So of the major operations in NATO that is reported by NATO, They've talked about the Korean War, the Bosnian War, the Afghanistan War. But for Africans, there are a number of operations that NATO were involved with that is not recorded in the official history. NATO was involved in the Suez Crisis in 1956. NATO was involved with the 
Congolese oppression and the killing of Patrice Lumumba. In fact, it was the infrastructure of the communication system of NATO that supported Belgium in the oppression in the Congo. And NATO is still um, party to the oppression that's going on in the Congo. But for Africans, the most outstanding efforts of NATO was its alliance with apartheid in South Africa and its alliance with Britain and France in the Atlantic and the Indian Ocean, uh, linking up with um, Simonstown in South Africa. And then the ultimate um, role of NATO was the destruction of Libya in 2011. Why would, next slide please. The Secretary General of NATO declared the liberation of Libya was one of the most successful operations of NATO. What did success mean for NATO in Libya? Next slide. Success meant that the European states, along with the United States, was able to thwart efforts of Africa to establish the economic foundations for a common currency. That is the assassination, humiliation, and sub sodomization of the president of Libya was consistent with the European and North American agreement that self-determination project in Africa at all costs should be stopped. So the question for Africans is that the, there's no possibility that Africans can support whatever actions NATO is taking in any part of the world. And as I've argued in my scholarship and in this book, the role of Africans is to call for the complete dismantling of NATO. Next slide, please. So the original members of NATO, of the 12 original members of NATO, nine of them were colonial countries. Belgium, Denmark, France, Italy, Netherlands, Portugal, United Kingdom and United States. Next slide, please. So post 1949, Greece and Turkey became members of the Alliance and in 1955, what was then called West Germany became a member of NATO and in 1982, Spain became a member. Next slide, please. So at the end of the what is called the Cold War, and Pan-Africanists do not call it the Cold War. Pan-Africanists are very conscious that what was called the Cold War was an expansion of racial capitalism to support the oppression and exploitation of African peoples. After 1991, the Europeans and the North Americans came up with what they call partnership for peace. We must underline that what is called peace in Europe is destruction in Africa. So in 1999, the Czech Republic, Hungary, Poland was added to NATO. And in um, 2004, Bulgaria, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Romania, Slovakia, and Slovenia became members of NATO. Next slide, please. So in this partnership for peace, in this partnership for peace, we had Albania and Croatia becoming members in 2009 and Montenegro in 2000. Now, after the 2000 period, when global opposition to capitalism expanded, there was an attempt to develop what is called global NATO. Global NATO consists of the original NATO countries plus the countries that were in the Mediterranean dialogue, Israel and the compliant members of the Arab League, the Istanbul Cooperative Initiative, and Afghanistan and Iraq were made contact partners, Australia, Japan, South Korea, and New Zealand. Next slide, please. And then the members of the Gulf Cooperation Council. I'm arguing in this presentation that global NATO, after 1991, the objective of global NATO was to defend the United States capital. Next slide. 
Next slide, please. So here we have global NATO. The objective of global NATO is for the military management of the international system. I want to repeat that. That after 1971, when the Bretton Woods 1944 agreement fell apart, in 1944, it was agreed that the US dollar would be pegged to $35 to one ounce of gold. But in the context of the wars against the Vietnamese people and wars of national liberation, the United States could not maintain its commitments under the Bretton Woods Agreement. And since 1991, during the Cold War, the United States would argue to its so-called partners in the West that the role of NATO was to defend them from communism. But after 1991, it was most explicit that the role of NATO was to defend the United States dollar. Next slide, please. So the objective of NATO is for the military management of the international system. The military management of the international system means that in the past, they could talk of cultural management, diplomatic management, social management, and ideological management. But in the context of the rise of the global south, in the context of the demands for a new international economic order by the ASEAN countries, by the countries of BRICS, and by the African countries, the objective of global NATO was uh, to support the United States dollar. So there are two things that hold the United States dollar together, that is US capital markets and the US military. Next slide, please. So bring, this brings us to Ukraine. Ukraine, after 1991, had a series of governments. And what the media calls oligarchs, what, what, what is meant by oligarchs are those social forces in Ukraine and in the US and in Russia that are integrated in the Western capitalist system. But the, the geopolitical objectives of the Russian political leadership was that Ukraine should not become a member of NATO. And so since 2008, there has been a series of political changes in Ukraine and those political changes came to a head in 2014. In 2014, when the Russian military occupied Crimea, which has a, itself has a very long history, and the regions of Luhansk and Donbass, where the bulk of the fighting is going on right now. There were attempts. Next slide, please. There were attempts to negotiate after 2014 the threats to Russia in the East. I must add that Ukraine not only is a site of the oligarchs, but Ukraine is also the site of white supremacists. And one of the outstanding fascist of the World War II era was someone called Stepan Bandera. Stepan Bandera um, competed with Hitler as to who would be the most extremist. And so the fascist forces in um, Ukraine are quite formidable in the society. And that is why the African students who were leaving Ukraine were exposed to such brutal racist experiences in Ukraine. But since 2014, we've had Minsk 1 and Minsk 2. 
And these two discussions were about the future of Ukraine. As far as Russia was concerned, Russia was concerned that Ukraine should not become a member of NATO. And there were three aspects of Ukraine that the Russians stated. One, Ukraine should not become a member of NATO. Two, Ukraine should be neutral. And three, there should be negotiations over the future of Crimea and over the future of the Russian-speaking peoples. Now, since this 2014 war started, what we had is a deepening of the crisis of capitalism in the United States of America. Next slide, please. So here we have a picture of the region that were in dispute in Ukraine. Next slide, please. Let's get to the heart of the matter. Since the 2008 financial crisis, the United States has moved to the weaponization of everything. The weaponization of trade, which we saw under Donald Trump, weaponization of information, weaponization of currency, weaponization of technology. And it is now agreed that far more important than weapons are the deployment of United States economic tools for warfare. I, I am not very familiar with this by Mark Galliotti, but I'm much more familiar with the book by Michael Hudson, Finance and Warfare. The finance and Warfare goes into great details about the derogation of the United States and the United States dollar since um, 1991 and why the United States need to use military means. Next slide, please. So I have argued, and one of the references that I provided for this presentation was by um, Jacques Baud. Jacques Baud, the policy of the United States is always to prevent Germany and Russia from cooperating more closely. Uh, Jacques Baud is arguing that the war in Ukraine is actually a war against Germany that the United States of America in the military management of the international system, the United States of America is cautious lest the purchase of gas and oil from Russia by the European countries would tip the balance for greater cooperation between Germany and Russia. And Germany is the number one threat to the United States of America in terms of the fact that it has a strong industrial base and the fact that the, the euro could be an alternative to the dollar, dollar. Let me state that since the 2008, the weaponization of finance has meant that the United States has used its power over the dollar against the people of Iran, Venezuela, Iraq, Cuba, China, Russia. And so the weaponization is something that is very real. So the war in Ukraine, as many people are arguing, and this we can see from the various discussion in international relations theory. Our point of view today is to put forward what is the Pan-African view about this war that is going on in Ukraine. Next slide, please. We, from the Pan-African movement, condemn the Russian invasion of Ukraine. We feel the humanitarian crisis of the 7 million Ukrainians, Ukrainians who have been dispersed from their homes. But our position is that refugees from Ukraine are no different from refugees from Syria or refugees from Iraq or refugees from Africa 
there should not be any double standard in international law about humanitarianism. And so we now know from the United States that the war is not to support the Ukrainian people, but Lloyd Austin said, the administration wanted Ukrainians to win the war against Russia, not just defend themselves, and the US hoped to weaken Russia and to extend that it could not launch another provoked invasion. So the United States objectives, and many authors have argued that the United States will fight in Ukraine to the last Ukrainian to realize its objective of weakening Russia. Next slide, please. Now, all peace-loving peoples in the world want the war to stop. They want the United States and the Ukrainian people to negotiate. And the, whether the war started, when the war started on February 24th, and today is June 24th. Every day the war goes on, it deepens the immiseration of the people of Ukraine. And if the war stops today or tomorrow, the outcome is going to be the same. Ukraine will be neutral. Ukraine will not be a member of NATO. And there must be negotiations over Crimea and over the the, the, the Russian speaking. This is well known. It is so well known that even a hawk like Henry Kissinger, the former Secretary of State of the United States of America, told the Ukrainian they should find a peace deal. They should give up territory and they should sign a peace deal. In other words, it is well known, but the, the, the military faction of the United States leadership wants this war to continue to strengthen financial sector in the United States of America, to strengthen the military sector of the United States of America, and to weaken the Germans and ultimately to fight against the Chinese. Next slide, please. Let me move to the conclusion. The Pan-African position is that we are opposed to war. The resolution of the global Pan-African movement is we're opposed to the war. Next slide, please. We passed a resolution that said the Russian, the, they, that there should be an end to the war. There should be negotiations. There should be humanitarian assistance and there should be demilitarization internationally, not just in Ukraine, but especially in Africa and in parts of global Africa. Now, on June 24th, we can discuss what are the outcomes of the Ukraine war for the past four months. The Russian invasion of Ukraine will have far reaching consequences in a variety of areas. The situation has evolved into a humanitarian crisis, turned to a food crisis, energy crisis, and raises questions about the architecture of global security. In other words, as in World War I and World War II, the war in Ukraine is creating the conditions for a totally new international system. Where, where, where are Africans in this new international system? Next slide, please. The point is that every day the Ukraine war continues, these three crises, the energy crisis, the food crisis, and the inflation, the crisis of capitalism is creating a political crisis. And in this political crisis, the main beneficiaries of the political crisis are the neo-fascists in Europe and North America internationally. We have seen in the United States of America an explosion of white supremacist ideas so that every day the war continues. In France, we've seen the rise of Marie Le Pen. In Britain, we've seen um, Boris Johnson and Brexit. So we've seen an unraveling of what is called the liberal order. And what, what we've seen is the rise of, of, of and the strengthening 
of fascism. So out of every war comes revolution. Out of every, next slide please. Out of every war comes revolution. What we have seen today is in all parts of global Africa, the conditions of militarism, neoliberal exploitation, and the oppression of people are causing people to organize. Only on Sunday, we saw one of the major interventions in Colombia. Colombia is a very important arm of global NATO. And we saw the people of Colombia making a decision that they will not be part of global NATO and that they want to move from militarism and oppression to a new international system. Next slide, please. So from Colombia to Sudan, we've seen that the people in global Africa are moving to assert themselves against racial capitalism, against violence and against white supremacy. Next slide, please. This image is indelibly stamped in all parts of the world. This is an image of white supremacy. This is an image of the killing of George Floyd, which has elicited major mobilization in global Africa in the, the response of black people. Next slide, please. And this is what CLR James had to say about global events. Black peoples are the center of world events that the revolutionaries of the world need Africans as much as Africans need them. This is in the history of the Pan-African Revolt. So if, if the forum of Penn State is to decenter hegemonic epistemologies and decolonize Western canon and to facilitate other ways of knowing, then we should have other ways of understanding the Ukrainian war, other ways of understanding the history of NATO, and ways of understanding the ways Africa is inserted in the international system. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. I want to go, go to the end. So this is Italians. Next slide. So I am saying to the, the Global Forum at Penn State that Penn State is part of the Pan-African activity. That is to conceptualize the world from the point of view of the most oppressed people. And that their consciousness and their activities are not limited to African peoples, but to all peoples of the global south. And this war is having a tremendous impact. Now, as in all wars, one of the most um, important casualty of war is truth. I have been following militarism in war for over 50 years, but this war is the first one that I've seen psychological warfare and disinformation taken to its ultimate. There is nothing that one can read in the media, the Western media, that one can accept because so much of what is reported is distorted. So one of the things we as scholars and activists have to be able to do is to generate information about what's happening in Ukraine and the implications for the rest of the global Africa. Next slide, please. So we will end with the statement that no African will be free until all of Africa will, is free. In 1935, World War II started in Abyssinia. At the end of World War II, Africans mobilized to fight for political independence. At the end of the Vietnam War, Africans mobilized in Southern Africa. The mobilization at this point must be for the full unification and freedom of Africa in all parts of the world. Next slide, please. So Thomas Sankar told us we must dare to invent the future. We've seen the challenges from all parts of the global Africa. 
We've seen the destruction in Ethiopia. We've seen what's going on in Mali with self-determination. And we've seen the possibilities in Egypt trampled by militarism and repression. So how can we have a radical imagination, radical Pan-African imagination? Next slide, please. By looking at reparations campaign in global Africa as a social movement, we discovered it was never entirely or primarily about money. The demand for reparations was about social justice, reconciliation and reconstructing the internal life of Black America and eliminating institutional racism. I want to end with this idea of Robin D.G. Kelly, of the radical, Black radical imagination that offers a new vision and set of values by which individuals, organizations, societies can operate to properly reconcile with their past. This is my view of the Pan-Africanism and the war in Ukraine. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Campbell, um, for this thought-provoking presentation. So I will now like to hand over to Prof. Marconi to start the discussion. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Oris. Thank you very much, uh, Edwin. I, I want to start off uh, by shifting to Russia. Uh, from your reading of the, scholar, of the body of scholarship at the moment, what is the impact of the Ukrainian war on the Russian people's own sense of their national identities? Well, as I said, it is difficult mm -hmm. for one to make analysis as African scholars mm -hmm. of what's going on in Ukraine and in Russia because mm -hmm. of this information. Mm -hmm. That the psychological warfare and disinformation of Russia is so intense that one yes. cannot make sense of it. Mm -hmm. So in many ways, the media personalizes this war in relationship to Putin. Mm -hmm. But the issues that we're talking about in Ukraine but, and the expansion mm -hmm. of NATO is bigger than Putin. Mm -hmm. What I do know is that as someone who is a scholar working on the Soviet Union and socialism, is that the present ruling class in, in, in Russia, that is the people are called oligarchs, are objectively allies of the West. And that mm -hmm. they had collaborated with the United States and the IMF and World Bank to strip Russian economy of their assets so that the Russian economy was denationalized from 1991 and placed in the hands of people who have yachts and have billions of dollars. Mm -hmm. My understanding is that in Russia, and I, I've read someone like Boris Kagalitsky, who Kagalitsky was an opponent of the Soviet Union is someone like a social democrat. And those forces are very much alive. In fact, one of the opponents of, 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 of Putin is someone who wants Russia not to have close relations with the West as Putin did. So I, I can draw from the scholarship that I know of Russian scholars who oppose the neoliberal agenda that Russia has been on since 1991. But in terms of what is called dissidents in Russia, Navalny, and those forces that are promoted by the Western media, it's very difficult for me to judge the depth and the support they have within Russian society. Okay, thank you. Let me then uh, continue to, let me raise another issue that you touched upon, uh, which I think is relevant to all of us, the issue of white supremacism and war. Can you just elaborate a bit about how the, what you call the unraveling of the liberal order is to some extent creating conditions for the emergence and sustenance of white supremacism? Yes, mm -hmm. well, the liberal order was a camouflage mm -hmm. at all times for genocide the most massive genocide took place against the First Nation peoples 
and the people mm -hmm. who are on this um, this call do not know the book of Dunbar Ortiz, the history of the indigenous peoples of the United States of America, mm -hmm. I would recommend this to them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The genocide of 100 million people in the Americas lay the foundation for the establishment of the transatlantic slave trade, enslavement, imperialist partition of Africa. All of the ideas of liberalism, that is John Locke, the ideas of property, the ideas of property came out of taking the land of the First Nation peoples. So one of the things that we have to do is mm -hmm. to get beyond the shibboleths of liberal capitalism. Mm -hmm. We have to be able to analyze what were the constituent, constituent components of capitalism and imperialism, which is always based on genocide and violence. In the past 20 years, however, the, the, the kind of liberal alliances that we've seen cannot hold because people in all parts of the world are opposing Western domination, whether it is in Iran, Iraq, Afghanistan, Venezuela, Cuba, China. And so the United States has deployed its military might in no uncertain terms. But the military might in the United States of America is very much linked up with white supremacy. The military might of the United States is linked up to the deployment of whiteness, guns, and the coalescence of maintaining white hegemony in the United States of America. So if we're going to fight for democracy, and I think that is what we are all mm. about. Mm. If the Pan-African movement is to fight for democracy, then we should be fighting for the right of every person in the planet Earth to be able to live, to breathe, and to live on the planet Earth. And most of the countries that the United States support, especially in West Asia, are very, very anti-democratic. One cannot understand why the president of the United States would be going to Saudi Arabia, which is an extremist state, the United States that allied with the state of Israel, which um, the Human Rights Watch has called uh, apartheid state. It's aligned with the United Arab Emirates. And if the goal of the Pan-African movement and Pan-Africans are to support democracy, then people in the United Arab Emirates or Saudi Arabia or the United States should have one vote and they should have democratic rights. It, I, I just came back from the Sudan two days ago. And what is amazing for me when I listen to the news is the kind of the kind of um, the kind of charade that goes on in the United States of America. The United States of America cannot find discussions about reparations for Africans who were enslaved, but the United States is pushing reparations for the Ukrainian people. So that for me tells us that there's a double standard in the world. You can have all the people from the United States, from the Belfast Center in Harvard, from the think tanks in Washington, talking about reparations for the Ukrainian people, but the very same United States cannot pass a law against police violence in the United States of America. So it seems to me that we in the intellectual world have to be able to define our own agenda. Good. Let me then, um ask another point of clarification before I hand over to Edwin. You said that somehow the war in Ukraine is a war against Germany. Can you elaborate a bit more what exactly is the reason why you ended up with uh, that proposition? Yes, I, I, I am persuaded uh -huh. and I, one of the articles that I sent to be shared mm -hmm. is by a Swiss colonel called Jack Baud. The policy of the USA has always been to prevent Germany and Russia from cooperating more closely. The same argument is made by Michael Hudson and the same argument is made by other scholars. The, the, um, the Germans and the French have been talking for the past 10 years about creating a new military alliance, which is different from NATO. It is called PESCO, Permanent Structured Cooperation. Permanent Structured Cooperation 
of the Germans and the French is for them to develop an autonomous military industrial apparatus, which is not dependent on the United States military industrial apparatus. So they, they have been pushing for PESCO in the past um, 15 years. I was in Germany in 2019 at the um, 70th anniversary of NATO. And the, 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 the intellectuals in Frankfurt were talking about the possibilities of PESCO. So the United States is very afraid that the French and the Germans would create an alternative to NATO, which is PESCO, which would then support the euro and then support the euro's ability to have the sale of oil indexed in the euro. And the argument of Jack Baud, I would recommend it to you because it goes into great details about the machinations of the United States since 2014 to ensure that the situation deteriorates in, in um, Ukraine. I will only add that apart from PESCO and the Euro, we have the Russians um, building a pipeline called Nord Stream. They, they have two pipelines, one through Ukraine and one in the Baltic Sea that brings natural gas from Russia. The, the, the opening of that pipeline has been suspended. It is finished, but the United States want um, the Germans to buy much more expensive natural gas from Texas and from the United States than to buy it from Russia. So there are three levels, military, currency, and energy, which are the three axes of global warfare at the present moment. Thank you very much. Let me hand over to Edwin, because there are a lot of uh, comments and discussions in the chat, in the chat box. Edwin. Thank you, everyone. Um, we can kindly prepare questions and we can use the reaction, the raise hand reaction. If we would want to ask questions, you can raise up your hand or you can physically raise up your hand if it's visible. And then I would invite you to ask questions. But um, in the chat box, Taboho is asking a question um, about the connection between research and politics. And he says, my biggest concern at the moment is how intellectuals can work with African leaders into sharing and taking up intellectual conclusions, policy and implementation. This calls for an active department of African Union that collates research and distributes the knowledge to African leaders. So the center of research and communication of EU dynamic coordinator. So his question is that, um, can Prof. Campbell talk to this link since he has been active in AU politics for some time? Thank you. I am not so sure I've been active in AU politics. Mm -hmm. I'm active in promoting the unification of Africa and the support for African peoples. I must, I must stress that there's been a disengagement of African intellectuals from the NATO destruction of Libya, that we should not take our cue from what the Western media is saying. At the time of the NATO destruction of Libya, 200 African intellectuals wrote a very important statement to the United Nations that Libya is an African country and the 200 intellectuals in Africa were very clear about what they said, Libya, Africa, and the New World Order, an open letter to the peoples of Africa and the world from concerned Africans. What we've seen is that the so-called aid agencies, the so-called think tanks have spent billions of dollars trying to divert the attention of Africans from the role of France, from the role of the United States and the US Africa Command in Africa. So I think it's up to forums such as these and the kind of scholarship that we can unleash to say, what is the response of the world 
to the treatment of African students in Ukraine. I saw a video yeah. of a young man who was escaping from Ukraine. And this young man, he was a medical student. He was in um, Ukraine and he escaped to Germany. And when he got to Germany, he was stripped and searched and humiliated because as far as the German customs and immigration people, he could not be a legal refugee from the crisis in Ukraine. It is my view that the African scholars must engage with the kind of humiliation that has gone on to African peoples all over the world. And we are at one in sympathy with Ukrainian people. But there is no difference between a Ukrainian refugee and an African refugee, whether they come from Mali or whether they come from any other part of the world. And I think our intellectuals have a responsibility in terms of defining what are the priorities of global Africa. Yeah. So Tamo is also asking another question. And he starts with um, a few quotes that racism itself, as Asante advocates, requires Africans to establish conditions of independence at all levels from Euro American entanglement, where they are sucked into domination. A collective approach of committed Afrocentric Pan Africans lead a charge to remove all references of themselves as colonized and neo colonized, etc. African intellectuals paved the way to realize African-centered mentality and actions. If not this orientation, Prof. Campbell, um, he's asking if you could indicate what option uh, there are for the liberations of African from mental slavery of Euro-American hegemon. Um, I think one of the main challenges for us is to build networks to build networks of scholars who will support each other, build networks of teachers and students, PhD doctoral students who will do research and will strengthen each other as far as these things are concerned. Let me, let me give you an example. I have just come from Sudan. Sudan is a country that is in a revolutionary process. The, 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 the resistance committees in the, in the Sudan have had a situation of dual power. And while I was in the Sudan, I had to go back and read Marx. I had to read Marx uh, and read Marx on the Paris Commune. And everyone was a revolutionary. Read about the Paris Commune. The Paris Commune lasted 72 days. And it was said to be one of the great organizations of working people of self-emancipation. So Marx, Lenin, Trotsky wrote about the Paris Commune. How many African scholars are engaging what is going on in Mali or in Senegal or in South Africa or in, 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 in Sudan? It, it seems to me that we should be clear about the priorities of the global Africa and we, in determining our priorities, we should maintain the scholarship accordingly. I, I gave a presentation here in February on reparations and the university. Reparations is a leading aspect of um, global Africa. But how many of us are doing research on reparative justice, on the unification of Africa and those questions? So yes, the platforms such as these and senior scholars must be able to bring a new generation of younger scholars and activists who have the global Africa at the front of their vision. Okay. Yeah. And Arthur is also asking a question about the African American community. And so he, he's asking what you see as the condition of and possibilities within the African-American community in relation to the global struggle that we are talking about? I would, I would say from where I sit in Syracuse today, the Black struggle in the United States is one of the most advanced 
sections of Pan-Africanism. The history of black political organizing from the Civil War in the 1860s down through fighting against the KKK, the Garvey movement, fighting for civil rights, fighting in the Black Radical Congress, up to the Black Lives Matter movement. The Black people in the United States of America who bear the brunt of racism on a day-to-day -day level, the children in schools, the prison industrial complex, police violence against Black people, redlining in housing, unemployment, the intellectual political organization of Black Americans are very high. And that requires that the oppression is very high in the United States of America. Unfortunately, there is a difference between the Black middle class and Black politicians like um, the Black the defense sector who said the objective of the United States is to weaken Russia, that we need to strengthen the relations between Black people in the United States of America and other oppressed peoples in the United States of America, and to strengthen the relations with global Africa. One example of this is the Caribbean Reparations Commission. The Caribbean Reparations Commission, which is linked up with the Institute of the Black World in the United States, linked up with INCOBRA and the reparations movement in the United States of America, they've taken the intellectual and political leadership on these questions. Similarly, with Black women, um, the Black um, radical feminists in the United States of America have taken the lead in taking the questions about care, about what kind of society we need in the 21st century. So our challenge is how do we consolidate our work and build relations with other oppressed peoples in other parts of the world? Yeah, um, I would like to remind us that for those who would want to ask questions, you can kindly raise up your hand, Sally Coco. Thank you, Professor Campbell, for a clear articulation of what is in, involved in the war in Ukraine and what the history behind it. Mm -hmm. And I would be uh, remiss not to underscore the fact that Africa has been exploited for the past millennium, half millennium, I'm sorry, for the past half millennium by uh, European or Western colonial powers and so forth. And I agree uh, there must be some sort of unified approach to claim reparations from the West and so forth. But on the other end, I think there's something missing. What is the approach that Africa can develop in order to find itself not in the same kind of predicament where we are waiting from we are waiting for leftovers from the West? So let me try to explain this. The pandemic and the war in Ukraine have exposed weaknesses in the worldwide globalized economic system. Um, that you, you cannot really feel comfortable in the globalized system if you as a country are in the position of just producing raw materials, but not producing finished industrial products. And to get in that finished products for the same raw materials that you have produced, you have to wait until the West has served itself. Another thing that has become obvious that even if you are a world power, the system of outsourcing services is very dangerous. You know, we saw it during the pandemic with 
shortage of masks in the beginning. We had to resort to cloth masks and so forth because that was more expedient. Why? Because the outsourcing system depended on China and other places. And with the uh, disconnection of um, the transportation system, goods couldn't come fast enough. So the need for respirators, do they call them respirators? The uh, thing that you know had to enable people to breathe in the hospital and so forth. Okay, the United States didn't have enough of those. Well, but because the United States has, has such a strong economic system, it could bounce back very quickly by reorganizing the industry and producing a lot of them and even be able to export them. We in Africa couldn't solve these kinds of problems because we have accepted a system of just producing raw materials since the 15th century and not producing finished materials that can make life easier for ourselves. In the system, in the in the meantime, one thing you know, intellectuals have done their share of showing how much they understand about the world, and this is what you have done today. But what has the African politic political leadership learned from all this? What can Africa do, or what should we recommend to our leadership so that? Africa wouldn't be, say, it was Makizal who went to Russia and met with Putin. And he went there really just to say, please stop the war, otherwise we are going to starve in Africa. But not because, not, not, uh, because Makizal seemed really very much interested in peace over the world if the interest in peace was more to prevent starvation in Africa, but no strategy has been taken by African leaders to prevent, to, to prevent what being held hostage for food for a war that involves different nations. What is your take on all this? Well, thank you very much. My take is that we have a vibrant, vibrant activists, politicians, and progressive Africans. One of the outcomes of the Ukraine war is the shift in the emphasis on the Security Council to the General Assembly of the United Nations. If you move the discussions from the Security Council to the General Assembly, Africans constitute the majority. Africans, if you had the 70 countries of Africa, 54 in Africa, 20 in the Caribbean, plus the African population in Latin America, Africans constitute the majority. And in 1973, 74, Henry Kissinger took the discussion about world politics out of the General Assembly to the Security Council for the United States veto. Because Russia has a veto in the Security Council, the United States is now taking matters back to the General Assembly. Now, we have seen in the war in Ukraine, the activism of African intellectuals, even leaders, that Africans should not be forced to take sides. That is, Africans have their own priority. And I have mentioned the priorities in Mali, priorities in the Horn of Africa, priorities in Libya, that we should say that the war in Ukraine is one part of a global tragedy of militarism. That's the first point. The second point is the collaboration in international relations with what is called A3 plus one. A3 plus one are the African three members of the Security Council plus the one Caribbean members who have been very active on questions of the permanent forum, the Durban anti-racist questions. So I, I would say that 
we have not highlighted enough the work that is going on among Africans. Even African leaders, despite their limitations, during the COVID, they talked about vaccine apartheid. And the, the African leaders talked about the need for the patents on vaccine to be lifted so that vaccine production could take place in other parts of the world. So I would say that the efforts towards the African continental free trade area, the efforts towards the um, processing of minerals from the Congo and the scholarship on cobalt and Colton is saying that what difference it would make if cobalt and Colton were processed right there in the Congo. Now, we know in those examples that there are active elements like the presidents of Rwanda, the presidents of Uganda, who are actively opposed to Africans having more autonomy. And I think we have to be bold enough to call out leaders, such as the leader of Rwanda, who's acting to destabilize the Congo. As we speak today, we have genocidal language and genocidal violence being generated in Eastern Congo because of the role of the Rwandese government. So I, I would say to you that we need vigilance among African scholars, and this vigilance means that we define our research agenda. I do not believe all is doom and gloom. You know, I think that we, um, we, 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 we should take a page out of our brothers and sisters in Latin America and a page out of our brothers and sisters in, in Asia who are creating new institutions so that Africans should not go for just presentation and representation. There's an African woman who is now the head of the WTO. But in reality, the WTO is irrelevant because people want new rules of the game in the international system. And I will tell you that we will have new rules of the game at the end of this Ukraine war because the Ukraine war is creating a new, what Janet Yellen called deglobalization. The, 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 the institutions that were set up after 1991 that was called globalization, they do not work. And that's why the United States have to use military and force in all parts of the world. And that is not working either. Um, so still on the uh, Excuse me. I agree with you, uh, but I think that what you have really made obvious is the fact that different countries work, should first work in their own interests. And second, at the World Forum, when different countries have to negotiate with each other, it doesn't matter whether you have a seat at the discussion table or not. But what matters the most is that you will be listened to if you have economic power, military power. And what seems obvious to me about Africa is corruption has made all this impossible. We cannot just count on reparations. We could should count on alternative ways of countering half a millennium of exploitation. And the other thing, because you also mentioned the role of African America in this, and what I have to really say as an African, as a Congolese, is our African leadership has let African America down because African America has fought so much for rights that we are all entitled to. But the African leadership has chosen to serve European sponsors for power and not European sponsors or Western sponsors for power, but not Western sponsors for develop the development of Africa and for the economic independence of Africa. Mm -hmm. I couldn't agree with you more. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. No, um, still, still on, still on the effects of. Okay, um, Arthur. 
Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to say something uh, in response to Sally's uh, very important comment. And Sally and I have spoken privately on this before. But my view is that overall, in terms of African leadership during the last 300, 400 years, and I won't explain why I limit it to that, is that we've had a number of what we could call progressive African leaders. But in my view, whenever one emerges, such as Sankara, Lumumba, and so on and so forth, the international colonial forces merge to eliminate them. So I'm talking about the tension between the idea that African leaders are on the whole, we might say accomplices, or whether there have been forces in place to eliminate those who would not be accomplice, accomplices. And that's the question, the double-headed question that is always with us in any talk about struggle. Uh, I happen to feel that leadership of the kind we want has emerged in Africa and elsewhere in the African world, but the forces against them are very powerful and unfortunately they have been eliminated eventually. So what are your thoughts, Professor Campbell? Yeah, thank you very much. I, uh, I think we have to have a new concept of leadership. What we, what the, the leadership we had was on great men in the past. And what we saw in South Africa from Soweto, the United Democratic Front, to the fees must fall and for the social services struggle is that we have a different leadership that is coming from among the youth. So we, 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 we need to, de, to take away from our mind the concept of great men and great leaders. Mm -hmm. Because as you rightly pointed out, they will kill them. They killed Lumumba, they killed Samora Michelle, they killed um, Che Guevara, they killed um, um, all the leaders. I'll come back to what's going on in the Sudan. You have leadership from women at the grassroots, in the communities, in all parts of the country. And this leadership is creating a new state, an alternative state. And the West is calling on the Sudanese to negotiate with the military. The, the Sudanese people are saying the military is illegitimate. The military is a mercenary force that serves the United States in Saudi Arabia, fighting in Yemen, served in Central African Republic, in Chad, and in Libya. And the people are saying, the resources of the Sudan should be for the Sudanese people. And the Sudan is an African country. In fact, what the revolutionaries in say, the greatest thing happened to them is the awareness. So we need to have a different conception of leaders and leadership. And our work should be to strengthen and highlight the new resources that are coming up and so we can learn. Let's, let's even in a place like the Caribbean. I think you've heard of the new leader called Mia Motley in, in Barbados. I think you've heard of her, right? Who has been speaking in the United Nations at the World Climate Conference. But Mia Motley as a political leader can only speak because of the collective ideas in the Caribbean against imperialism. And I think that's what we want to build up in Africa, a collective opposition to imperialism that is not suppressed. And all over Africa, we have these leaders who promote xenophobia, division, and exploitation of the working people. So we, in our libraries, in our universities, we should at all times ensure we are not prey to any kind of xenophobia and um, dividing of Africans. Okay. So Angela is asking, how will the Pan-African movement, what they call approach, seek to continue the work Libya started with the African currency? 
Yes. This is where we need work. I was at a conference two weeks ago in Tanzania, where the governor of the Bank of Tanzania was speaking about the East African currency. Now, it doesn't take rocket science to have an East African currency because 40 years ago, there was an East African currency. Kenya, Tanzania, and Uganda had the East African shilling. Imperialism destroyed the East African community just as they destroyed Libya. So we will not be reinventing the wheel. Now, there are technical matters about the African currency, the convergence processes, what do we with stock markets? What do we with African capital markets? And these are issues that require engagement at the intellectual level. Our economists are not dealing with this thing. How many economists have written papers about what happened to Libyan reserves? What has the United States done with the billions of dollars in Libyan reserves? I, I, I am suggesting that we, we need a two-track approach to the African currency, a political approach, which raises the question about African independence and an intellectual approach which harnesses the information. Sudan exports gold, Uganda exports gold, Tanzania exports gold, Ghana exports gold, and everybody is hoarding gold today because they know the United States dollar is very, very, very shaky. So the Saudi Arabia and the United Emirates, they're all, all importing gold. What if Africans created an African gold pool to back the African currency. That is not just words. That gold pool requires the technical work to put that in motion. So I'm saying we have work to do and we're not doing it. Okay. Thank you, Angela. You are muted. I want to say too that a, a, a critical part of all this is the education of our peoples to understand what it is, the thinking, what has happened and what is happening. If we don't have the support of the people, then the leadership will get away with anything. But once the people are, in, um, are educated and involved in the process, they will push the movement from the base and there'll be more success. That is my opinion. Thank you very much, Angela. I, 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 I must say that Angela is part of the grassroots pan-Africanism that I'm talking about in the Caribbean, that the governments of the Caribbean cannot retreat from. So whether it is in Jamaica or St. Vincent or Barbados, when governments take position on pan-Africanism, they, um, they have grassroots people like Angela, who's in the trenches among the people. So thank you very much for showing up, Angela. And we, we thank you for your support. You're welcome. Okay. Um, Ashraf is asking a question about, I think you've talked about Sudan with the grassroots and the women uh, movement, but Ashraf is asking a question about what you have seen on the ground in Sudan. Um, and if you could tell us how the ongoing revolution um, is a threat to the new liberal order. And he puts this across that, um, by the way, um, on June 30th, um, there will be protesting matches and pro-democratic demonstrations inside and outside the country. So the global solidarity is mostly to dismantle colonially inherited structures. But his main question is how the groups are a threat to the new liberal order. Who's asking this? Ashraf. Good. Um, the, since 2019, there have been demonstrations every day in the Sudan. Since 2019, there have been killings every day in the Sudan. And in October 25th, 2021, the military actually unleashed a military coup in order to undermine the discussions about a transition to democracy. I would want to stress that this necessity of solidarity with the Sudanese people is something that we need to intensify. The June 30th demonstrations that are planned 
in the Sudan is to highlight the fact that the United States, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, IGAD, the United Arab Emirates are trying to force the people to negotiate, negotiate to the point where they, 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 they succumb to the military because the military is actually a tool for Western imperialism in the world. And the people of Sudan are calling for our support to say they want justice. They want demilitarization. They want a dismantling of the military in the Sudan that is being deployed against African liberation. And I think one of the things we need to do is to intensify our work to, of solidarity with the people of the Sudan. Okay. Yeah, so Christine is also asking, so Christine says, thanks a lot for the interesting discussion, Prof. Campbell. What possible connections do you see between the left-wing movements in South and Latin America, such as in Argentina, Chile, Peru, Bolivia, Colombia, and the global African claims, concerns, and agenda? Yes, this is probably one of the most exciting areas of global Africa. Let me stress that for 63 years, the Cuban revolution has held the line against neoliberalism and imperialism. And the Cuban revolution and the Cuban peoples have paid a very high price for this. But after 63 years, the West and the Western militaries have failed to break the back of the Cuban revolution. And we cannot speak on any platform without acknowledging the debt we owe to the Cuban people for their support for African liberation. That the Cubans fought in Africa in Kutukono Valley to defeat white racism and apartheid. So it is the traditions of the Cuban revolution that we see being experimented in Venezuela. There are many problems with the leadership of Venezuela, but it is for the Venezuelan people to work out their internal problems and not for the United States to dictate to them what terms they should interact with the international financial system. And we've seen in Chile, in Honduras, in Bolivia, in Peru, that the awareness of the need for Latin American cooperation with the Caribbean against US imperialism is very advanced. And we, we saw that last week at the Conference of the Americas when Joe Biden called the Conference of the Americas and the president of Mexico said, we're not going if, if Cuba cannot be there. So the, 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 the heightened political mobilization in Latin America is of great benefit for Africans everywhere. We had a conference in Barbados um, three weeks ago on the permanent forum for African descendants. And one of the things we are lamenting is the fact that African intellectuals are not as engaged with the questions of Latin America as they should. And we are hoping to have delegations from Africa and African scholars go to countries such as Venezuela and to Colombia. And I, I cannot stress that the Colombian breakthrough on Sunday has tremendous importance for global Africa. Colombia was the Latin American front for global NATO. And we can see that the Colombian political leadership under Petro and Marquez will break the United States hold over the people of Latin America. So I think there are exciting times ahead and I think we should all be involved with this. Okay, um, we can still raise up our hands if we would like to ask questions. Um, but before that, Arthur is asking, how do you view the proposition that we must not forget to stress strengthening the foundation of liberatory activism? Education at all levels in service to de-indoctrination and economic development at all levels. From neighborhood to national community, these in conjunction with other aspects of the struggle. And so that's his question. Thank you. I am, I want to say that liberatory activism comes from liberatory ideas. One of the things Walter Rodney taught me is that whenever anything is happening in the world, we should have an African point of view. 
about these things. And I want to stress that what I was trying to present today in this discussion is what I consider to be an African approach to fighting for peace in Ukraine. Pan-Africanists want an end to the war in Ukraine. We want an end to the Russian invasion. We want negotiations. But Pan-Africanists cannot talk about the war in Ukraine without talking about the war against Libya or the United States and Israel and France and their relationship to the Congolese people. So liberty activism re requires informed Pan-Africanists. And we need more forums of this sort so we can unleash the discussion about Africans. I wrote an article in, um, in, in March, Testing New Weapons, the Meaning of the Russian Invasion of Ukraine. And my, my objective at that point was to say, what did we learn? from World War I, World War II, and other wars. What will happen to Africans out of this? And we need to advance that. So liberatory thinking means that we need liberatory spaces and we should not be carried away by the propaganda and the what we call the brain hacking in the algorithms of oppression that are being unleashed by social media to confuse our youth. Thankfully so far, the, the, there's a sizable section for our youth or not taken away by the brainwashing that we see that is going on by the propaganda war that is coming from the West. But we need to expand that. Mm -hmm. And the economic development at all levels. Of course. Yeah. Of course. Wait, let's not call it economic development. Let's call it economic transformation. Mm -hmm. So we can transform the economic relations in Africa, where we can turn the coltan into batteries. We can turn the water into dams and electricity so that we have the full electrification of Africa. So yes, the econ development has some linear conception. We don't want to develop like the Chinese. They develop to the point that they cannot breathe. They have developed industrially to the point that their economy in developing iron and steel. So we want a transformation of the economic relations so that the resources of Africa serve the African people and serve humanity. You're, you're on mute. Angela, you can, you can. Um... Well, we, well, we have the example of Marcus Garvey. Mm -hmm. Marcus Garvey had a black star lane ship and company. We in the Caribbean, we, with the Ukraine war, we are suffering from transportation problems because you can't get the goods coming from this place that are too expensive because we are depending on these people but we do, why don't we have in the Caribbean a shipping company? What is Africa doing about their transportation problems? These are all, we have examples. Um, Marcus Garvey had the United Negro Improvement Association in a lot of countries now, especially in Barbados. So we have examples. So when are we going to start using the examples we have to develop ourselves? I, 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 should, add, I should add that Angela has some experience in this. She was a permanent secretary in the government. So she has some experience in transportation and shipping and those things. So she's speaking from real experience. Not permanent secretary, but for, uh, deputy chief technical officer in aviation and shipping. Yes. That's right. <laughs> yes. So she, and we, and we have been trying to get uh, 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 South African airlines to come to Barbados for years. We have a, uh, a services agreement with, with Nigeria. But we have not have been able to get these these countries because we, you know what, the process of colonization has kept us apart where we need to be closer. I have to go to England to first in Nigeria, where we could just run across the sea and we can be there. So these are the things that we need to explore at this time if we're going to defeat the capitalist forces. We have to stop talking and really work on them. Thank you. If, if I can uh, say something, yeah. that's what I meant by the African leadership really dropping the ball <laughs> and not <laughs> moving. Uh, the road infrastructure in most of Africa is terrible to the point where an African country couldn't even defend itself by road. 
<laughs> the airlines have not uh, been very successful. Uh, you know, one airline that we were particularly very proud of was South African Airline, and it has shut down. A lot of um, African airlines cannot operate in Europe because they are malfunctioning. <laughs> the number of air crashes that have not been reported is very high. Uh, so, but these are the things that are crippling the transformational development of Africa that Professor Campbell was referring to. Uh, so we have, I think, to have, we have to take things in our own hands. And one way of doing it is stop corruption, is stop uh, internal warfare. Uh, we cannot really talk about peace in the world until we have, or before we have uh, established peace in our respective countries and things like that. And these are very critical things. So. These are the kinds of things that would make African countries powerful negotiation, uh, negotiators uh, at the World Forum. Thank you. I think I see, I see Brother Mark Mealy has his hand up. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you, Brother. Um, thank you again for the overall presentation. Um, I think that a lot of there's been some really interesting points I've tried to offer into the chat. Um, just based upon some comparisons of analyses, I think many of us uh, understand vis-a-vis -vis the continent and vis-a-vis -vis examples of other, uh, other parts of the world that seem to be, quote unquote, more successful between their governments, their elites, their students of different social forces and really building alternatives. But Professor, I wonder if you could just maybe just take a moment to offer just any insights or perspectives on the situation in Ethiopia. And the reason why I even asked that because, because we know there's a large diaspora uh, Ethiopian community uh, in different parts of the United States. And in some ways they seem to almost be uh, uh, in play as we you know, look at you know, politics here in the US in that regard. So uh, any observations there you could offer, that'd be great. Thank you. Yes, thank you, brother, brother, brother Mark. Um, and thank you for coming um, to this presentation. The Ethiopian situation is part of what we made in the conclusion that the Ukraine war brings us to the question of demilitarization. That is, the military management of the international system ensured that for the past 30 years, in fact, the United States has had proxy wars and had governments fighting on their behalf. Ethiopia is a good example where the regime that has been in power since 1991 had been deployed by the United States of America against the people of Somalia. And the government of um, the Mele Zenawi was an ally of the United States of America. Now, we do not know the extent to which the efforts to launch a war in Tigray was associated with the war in Yemen or the wars in Ukraine. These are years of research that needs to continue. But the, 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 the devastating fact about Ethiopia is the level of killings that are going on. On Monday, 300 Amara people were killed in Ethiopia. People were killed in all parts of the country. And the media only points out to this, point us in this direction when it is their allies that are being killed. Now, Ethiopia is a very special place for Pan-Africanists. Ethiopia was the independent country throughout the colonial period, and Ethiopia is the headquarters of the African Union. And I think we need far more engagement of people in global Africa to support demilitarization and reconstruction in Ethiopia. That is the Ethiopian model of government and militarism is at variance with the needs of the Ethiopian people. Now, we have a very, very large Ethiopian diaspora, that is people who live outside of Ethiopia. And we need to engage them to say, what can be done for the reconstruction of Ethiopia? 
and bring peace in the societies in Ethiopia. The United States government, that is the, um, the, 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 the Congress and the United States um, um, Senate have moved to pass sanctions against the Ethiopian people. I think these are not helpful. And you who are there in Washington, we need to engage the people in the um, House Africa Committee, the House Foreign Relations Committee, and we need to generate the kind of information about Ethiopia that we used to generate about Southern Africa so that there's general understanding about what is going on in Ethiopia. So yes, what I would want to suggest that we need to focus on the demilitarization of Ethiopia, that the problems of, of, of ethnic manipulation, the problems of exploitation cannot be resolved by military means. They can only be resolved by peaceful means and negotiations. Okay. So there are a couple of comments thanking you in the um, chat section and a couple of comments highlighting some of the points that you said. So I'd like to read them and if anyone has, so we are concluding. So if anyone has any questions, um, th they could raise up their hands. And so um, Ashraf is, is talking about, he says, hats off to you, Prof. Horace Campbell. Social scientific scholarship, it's, it's so silent on the currently ongoing revolutions in Africa. We are almost ahead of in publications. The discourse and research agendas, as Simfri once noted, by itself made it unable to deal with issues of terrorism, revolutions, etc. Northern editorial practices in some established journals also contribute to the erasure of Southern revolutionary voices and struggles using the pretext of the impact factor. That is, papers on African revolutions will not be widely cited, and thus will affect the CV of the journal and the editor, etc. Yeah, so that's one of the comments um, with regard to publishing on terrorism and these relations. And there are also other comments. Um, thanking you for, for, for the presentation on African centered um, um, perspectives. Um, if there are no other questions, would okay, Prof. Prof. Makoni. I, I, thanks a lot, um, uh, Professor Campbell. I just want to shift the discussion a little bit to more mundane issues. Um, if, for example, you were to advise me on how to design a curriculum or a number of courses that would capture the arguments you are making, what sort of curriculum would that look like? Let's say I'm thinking of um, setting up a graduate program in which we have um, some of these ideas that we're talking about, let's say African perspectives on the Ukrainian war. What sort of courses would they look like? And what are the readings that you would propose? Well, you're giving me a tall order. <laughs> Unfortunately, the way our universities are organized uh -huh. does not lend to the kind of things you're talking about. Because what I presented to you today is an interdisciplinary understanding of mm -hmm. the war in Ukraine. This interdisciplinary mm -hmm. drew from history, drew from international relations, drew from political science, drew from environment, drew from military science. And it is that kind of interdisciplinary studies that we need in the study, study of reparations and reparative justice. As I presented before, mm -hmm. that the reparations question in the university brings all of these together. Mm -hmm. It brings the question of environmental justice, repairing the earth, racial capitalism, the mm -hmm. politics of oppression. So yes, we can design an interdisciplinary graduate course on, and I can work with you on such a course and we, work with a global PhD program for this kind of questions. We, because I am not presenting to you, I will not go to the canons of international relations and repeat what they have to say about the Ukraine war. What mm -hmm. I'm trying to do is to generate mm -hmm. our understanding of Pan-Africanism. That's why I went to Dubois. 
and say, what did Du Bois say about World War I? What did Du Bois say about NATO? What did Oris Campbell say about global NATO? So we have a body of literature that we can take students to. So um, how do we develop emancipatory ideas about war? So we are not carried away by the Western media and their humanitarianism. What about the Africans in Europe and the racism that is going on against them in Europe? These are, these are things that we can create a platform to build on. And I, I know that in, in Brazil, in South Africa, in the Caribbean, in Venezuela, they are very thirsty for this kind of cooperation across borders in dealing with an interdisciplinary Pan-African intellectual position. Because we, 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 the, in fact, the people who need this the most are in Europe. Because in Europe, the right wing in Britain, the right wing in Belgium, the right wing in France, the right wing in Sweden, they have overtaking liberal ideas. And it's just white supremacy, bringing back neo-Nazi ideas. So we have a responsibility to take the global perspective in anti-racism, in helping people in all parts of the world to transcend this political crisis that we're in. And it's not going to go away very soon. Yes. So now, so, Professor Campbell, why not just call it a Pan-African curriculum that teaches the basics of analysis? Wait, 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 wait. So, the Pan-African curriculum, that's all you need to call it? Well, 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 some t well, what do we do when we're teaching to people in, um, in Asia or people in Europe? In other words, we want a curriculum that would, I would say a Pan-African and Global South curriculum. Well, that's what we need. We call it what it is. We stop shying away from ourselves. Pan-African curriculum so that we have a, a, tool, a, a curriculum that gives us the, the information and the tools to analyze what is actually happening in our reality. Thank you. Yes, I will follow. Um, I'll, I'll be in touch with you on this global PhD to continue the conversation. Do you have any questions to pose? Um, not, uh, not a concrete question, but just mm -hmm. thinking about how um, I loved the part about not just um, other ways of knowing, which is what this mm -hmm. forum is about, but other mm -hmm. ways of understanding world events. Mm -hmm. um, and this was a very beautiful analysis of reading behind the news, but I was thinking of how do we get this, these other ways of understanding into the general African public space so mm -hmm. that people are not just reading the news, even the way we're self-understanding ourselves outside of our histories, the histories, how our histories have interacted with the world. So when you're in Ghana and you see um, gas prices rising, it's not just, oh, look at what the government is doing, but there are so many other forces co contributing to this. And so even having those understandings, not just in the academic sphere, like where we, we, we're getting it, but on the ground, you know, on the Monday morning, that bus driver, how do we help that bus driver to also understand that what you're reading in the paper is not just that there's more to it because of your history because of how our, um, the world has interacted with us because of world events happening so that's what i'm trying to think how do we bring this conversation into the public sphere mm. may i suggest in answering you that we start from our primary schools and our secondary schools to provide this curriculum that i'm talking about not just wait for university but in order for our people in order for our leaders to have power, our peoples must understand what the problems are, what the real, and then we can support them or push them into acting. And they know they have our support and it will be very successful. Thank you. Thank you. Good. All right. Um, and you said you, you, you raised your hand before Edwin wraps up and gives over to uh, Kim. You're, you're muted. Yeah, I didn't understand what you said just now. No, no, um, I was asking Anissa Kane. She was, she wanted to say something. No, I, I was actually clapping, so I'm free. I wasn't putting oh, my hand okay, up. Okay, okay, okay. Oh, that's fine. Then. And, and I continue to clap. I've heard so much amazing stuff, and it's okay. all true. And it takes me back to all the experiences of the horror that we've lived through in the last decades. Thank okay. you. Thank you. 
Right. Of this, this there, there are some interesting comments that I want to highlight before. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, so Mark is saying that we know that for many African governments, the new colonial base external relations have evolved from West to East, but still insufficient forms of relations which are catalyzing the processes of structural transformation. One nation, its governments and elites that have been watching is Indonesia. In under 10 years, Indonesia has transformed one of its colonial-based mining industries, Nikel, into a 21st century manufacturing industry, pr producing battery components for electronic vehicles. Um, I think this is an interesting. Yes, I think that we, we are not doing enough in terms of our relations with Indonesia, Vietnam, Malaysia, Singapore, and the ASEAN countries. When we speak about the genocidal traditions of the West, we do not know what is called the Jakarta method. That the United States in 1965 killed a million people in Indonesia. And what the United States has been doing since COVID is to try to mobilize the Indonesian people against Russia and against China. And the Indonesian people have said to the United States of America, well, we, we, we have our own interests. In fact, the Indonesians are the head of the G20, and they call a meeting in Washington in April. And Janet Yellen went to the Indonesians and said, well, we are not going to come to this meeting if Russia is not there. And the Indonesians said to them, that's your business. We are <laughs> the chairperson of the G20 right now, and we're going to have this meeting with Russia. So what we need is the kind of stamina and independence that we see from leaders such as Indonesian leaders. And so the white supremacy wants us to be mobilized against China. And I, I think the, the question about the future of China has to do with the future of a multipolar world. And the future of a multipolar world has to do with how Africa defines itself in the future in the global international system. And so I am urging us to, to do what um, Angela is saying that we need to go to the primary school. We shouldn't have a primary school anywhere in the world teaching that Christopher Columbus discovered America. <laughs> we should not have a primary school that um, John Hanning speak, discover the source of the Nile. That, that is, that we should go to primary and secondary schools so that we have a concerted effort to change the perceptions of our people about the world in which they live. Yeah. Right. So it's asking a question, how do we make sure that the economic transformation of African countries does not turn into other forms of capitalism? Well, to make sure of this is to go on the task. Capitalism does not have a future. One of the signs of the exhaustion of the capitalist system is a climate crisis. Capitalism produces wealth and accumulates until death. And the world cannot support a capitalist system which is based on polluting the world to the point of where we do what the Europeans did in the 19th and 20th century. So ultimately, in the economic transformation of Africa to turn solar energy into the full electrification of Africa, to build canal systems, road transportation system and um, very rapid transportation system, it requires radical imagination. In fact, Africa would leapfrog the industrialization of Europe and North America and Chinese. It is for us to be able to engage these new technologies. Well, I made a presentation for African Liberation Day last week where um, uh, one of the presenters talked about what are the potentialities for artificial intelligence for Africa and African cognitive skills. How do we unleash these things? Because um, artificial intelligence will change everything that we do, how we do business in the next 10 years. We need to be engaged in those questions right now. Isn't the artificial intelligence industry grounded in capitalism? Right now, right now, it does not have to be. 
Okay. So it does not have to be. It's like saying solar energy is organized by capitalist country. Solar energy does not have to be organized by capitalist country. Solar energy is energy from the sun. It could be democratized. In fact, solar energy by its very nature is democratic. Capitalism seeks to appropriate it. So it's for us to put the political effort into artificial intelligence so that we train our societies to unleash these technologies among our people. Okay. Well, the problem is whether we get rid of ownership, profit, and those kinds of notions. That, um, that is, is it going to be... That is a transition we are in. That okay. is, a, we are already in that transition because the, the United States and the Western Europe want to own the skies. They want to <laughs> patent hu human yeah. life. The, 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 the genetic engineering want to patent life forms. We're in a transition from that. One thing most third world countries are against is the intellectual property right regime of the WTO. We are already in the transition away from these ideas from the West. Yeah. Okay, so um, this has been a very interesting discussion. Yeah, very interesting one. Um, so we would, would like to end the formal session here and um, I'd like to call on Kim to give us um, our speaker for next week.